Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Crozet United Methodist Church. I'm Sarah, the pastor here, and this is our contemporary worship service. We're grateful to have you join us, whether you are present here in our sanctuary, watching with us online or archived. We're grateful that you have chosen to be part of our worship expression this morning. And so as we begin, let us take a moment and unite our hearts, minds, and spirits in prayer. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, today is a new opportunity. As we gather with you and with one another for worship, we are thankful for new beginnings, that each day as the sun rises, your grace is newly available to us. May we breathe it in and envelop ourselves in new opportunity, a chance to turn aside from the things that have led us astray and embrace a bright and beautiful future, which has been guaranteed to us by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant to us all that we need for strength and endurance, that we may persevere whatever lies before us in the days ahead. And above all, Lord, may this time be filled with praise and prayer. May we be enriched by this encounter, this experience, and the goodness of your presence and your love. May it be so. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. We're going to invite you to stand as you are able, and let us join together in our opening music, beginning with God of Wonders.
Miss Abigail, if she would like to come forward and read our psalm for us this morning. Thank you, Abigail. And if there are children who would like to come forward for children's time, you are welcome to join us up here. Good morning. Good morning. How are you all? Good morning, Miss Joy. You want to come over here, Joy? You want to come up this way? You can see? Good, good. Good morning. So today, we're going to finish out our worship series on graceful exits. And you all have been going to children's worship, but today I'm going to be talking about something that all of us know what it's like. Have you ever been afraid? Yeah? It happens, right? It happens when we're young. It happens when we're old. It happens when we're really vintage. All of us get afraid. We all know what it's like to have fear. So what do we do when we're afraid? What do we do? Ask God to help. You can ask God to help. That's right. You know, a lot of times when we're afraid, it feels better. Yes, ma'am. That's right. So you have an object. In this case, it's a worry doll, right? Some of you may have a stuffed animal. Some of you may have a pillow or a blanket. There are lots of different things that people can have that kind of help you to be reminded that you can turn over the things that are making you think that you are afraid or feel that you are afraid. Those are important things. Those are physical reminders that we are not alone 
and that we can overcome what we are afraid of. Because sometimes you can be so afraid that you can't even move, you can't think, you're just paralyzed with fear, and that is not the way God wants us to be. God wants us to be free from fear. In fact, God tells us in the Bible, do not be afraid, for I am with you. Wherever you go, and no matter what happens, I am always with you. And so when we talk about being afraid, and there are many things that can make us afraid. Sometimes we get afraid when there's a really loud thunderstorm or when the power goes out and it's really dark. There are a lot of things that can happen that make us afraid. But we are never alone, even if we think we are. Yes, ma'am. Yes, bad dreams, right? Even when your brain is playing into it. Yes, it's really hard, but this is one of the reasons why we talk about it now. So that when, if, or the next time you get afraid, you can remember, right? There are things that you can help focus on, whether it's a worry doll or maybe it's something else that makes you remember that you are loved. You can pray, you can talk to God about it. Sometimes it helps to find another person, right? Do you have somebody that helps you when you feel afraid, right? Sometimes it's even a pet. Some of us have pets that help us when we feel afraid. But all of those things are supposed to remind us that God is with us. And sometimes God makes God's presence known in people and in things and even in our pets. So we want to try to remember that because we don't want to be totally frozen with fear. Instead, we want to find the courage to keep moving forward. And so as we talk about fear, we want you to remind you. Sometimes it helps to even sing a song, right? You guys have been learning a lot of our songs that help to remind us. Right? The last thing we just sang, you are forever mine. No matter where you go and what is happening, God is always yours and with you. All right? Are you ready for children's worship? Okay. And Miss Whitney and Miss Laura are ready for you. And we will see you back in a little bit. And before we hear our last scripture of our Graceful Exit series, let us pray once more. Lord, send your Holy Spirit upon us once more. Allow us to experience the connection that happens when the movement of the Spirit comes upon us, knitting us not only to you but to one another. Help us to open our ears that we might not only hear but understand. Open our eyes that we might only just see a little further than we ever have before. And above all, Lord, open our hearts to you, to your word, and to your purpose for us this day. Help us to lean into a future that is filled not only with expressing the grace and the love that we have first received from you, but leaning into a future that enables us to be part of the good work and the holy encounters that people will have in the days ahead. May this world be better because of our time with you our relationship, and the gift of your unfailing love. May it be so. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes to us from the gospel account of John chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also, and you know the way to the place where I am going. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Amen. So we have come through a lot of things that we can exit in the course of our lives in this worship series. Again, we've talked about how to exit conversations. We've talked about how to exit relationships if and when that time comes. We've talked about how to exit a job. And just this morning, I got a testimonial about how just apropos that timing was. Come on in. <laughs> and how to leave a church, because sometimes that too happens. Well, today is, a, is an exit that all of us will one day take. Today, we're going to talk about how to exit life. What happens when we come to that point? We were all born, and one day, this life in this way will cease. So how do we gracefully exit from life? 
Now, I know some people are immediately going, this is morbid and I really don't want to talk about this. I respect that. I completely understand that. Death is not an easy thing. And honestly, culturally, it's not something we talk about. We kind of wait until it's happened and then we try to deal with it. But as Christians, God is giving us this prevenient opportunity. God's grace is coming to us even before we knew that we needed God's grace. And so it's important for us to think about these things. Because as I told our children at children's time, sometimes if you wait until you're afraid or you wait until something has happened, it's too late. You would have been better prepared to think beforehand or to at least confront the possibilities. And in the church, if there's one thing that we understand, it is death. We understand that and are reminded by it in the cross, but we are also reminded that death is not the end. And that is a really important foundation upon any conversation we have within the church about death. As scary as it may feel, as gut-wrenching and heart-rending as it can be, it is not the end. And that is vital for us to remember. Because when death does visit our lives, when we experience the loss of someone who is so precious, so important, so beloved, we can suddenly feel as if nothing is sure anymore. We can feel our very faith being rocked to the core. But we are a people that God has given a promise, a hope, and that there will be a day when we see someone who has gone before again, that they will be restored to us, not just restored to us as they left, but as they were always meant to be, with bodies that will never die. They will never again be sick. They will never experience cancer. They will never decay. They will never fail neurologically. They will always be perfect and joyful. And that's an important hope to have. Because when we talk about death, it makes a lot of us nervous. It makes a lot of us anxious. And for some of us, it brings back all kinds of horrible experiences and feelings. And so as we are moving forward into another aspect of our lives, coming out of a pandemic with so much loss and death, it is especially vital for us to consider how we are empowered to leave this life. And for some of us, that will be the last testimony that we ever have. Now, some of you will have legacies that will far outlast you. Maybe it's in your recording of your word or the writing of it. Perhaps some of you, it's in the relationships that you have had. But really, how you die will be the benediction on your life. And you are empowered to help people in that process. Now, some of us will never know when that day will come. It will just simply happen. And some of us are given the opportunity to kind of have an idea of when that may happen. As medicine and science continues to progress, we have more and more focus on helping people to die gracefully. We have hospice for those that we think is probably under six months. We have palliative care, pain management for those that are dying that recognize that there is no cure in sight, but that they can be pain-free and have their dignity preserved as they progress to that moment where this life ends before they're handed over to God. And as we are more and more aware and maybe growing to a different comfort level with that, it's important for us to think about what might that look like for us? Now, for some of you, that is so far off, it's unfathomable. But I had my first experience at a deathbed when I was 25. And I wasn't there as a granddaughter. I wasn't there as a family member. I was there as a pastor. And I remember thinking to myself, I have never experienced this before. I have never done this. In my family, they didn't usher all the children around the deathbed. That was not part of our tradition. And so the first time I saw it, I was there not only trying to wrestle with what I was experiencing and seeing and hearing and feeling, but I was also trying to remember that I was not just here as Sarah, I was here as Pastor Sarah. And what do you do with that? Now, in my case, it was good because I could compartmentalize and go, Sarah can, can totally fall apart later and have therapy, but Pastor Sarah needs to be on point right now. And so I was able to get through that, but I can remember going home and just feeling so exhausted 
having run this mental, emotional, and spiritual marathon at a deathbed. And I remember thinking, you know, there has to be a better way. There's got to be a better way for us to help people recognize what's happening in that moment and having the opportunity. Fortunately, the person whose deathbed I was at had great faith. And that person had been sharing that faith with their family and their loved one and their family of faith, their church, for decades. And it became such a gift to us because even at the end when they were no longer cognizant and they were no longer awake and aware, there was a peace to knowing that this person, even if they didn't want to feel pain, even if they were afraid of how the end was going to come, they knew where they were going. And Jesus was trying to tell us that in the gospel account of John. Jesus, knowing that he is going to die, on the night of his betrayal, he gathers with his disciples, whom he now calls his friends, and he tries to give them the words, give them words that they can recall, that they'll later write down, that they will speak to each other so that they can have strength and hope in time of need. And he tells them the words that we still in the Wesleyan Methodist tradition say at funerals to this very day. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe. Believe in God. Believe in Christ. And then the promise that that belief will have this. That where God is, there is a place for you and for you and for me, and for you, there is a place for all of us there. And God, in infinite love, is already preparing that place for you. And not only that, but God will go prepare it and then come back and take you there. We'll ease that transition for you. Because it's unknown. We don't know what is going to happen on the other side. There's a biblical understanding of what happens when we die, that we go into this place that the Old Testament calls Sheol. It's the land of the dead. It's a place where you rest in God. It's a place where all people, no matter how they lived and how they died, they are finally in this place together. And then there are beliefs that maybe we go right to heaven. Maybe there are beliefs that there's a holding place for us. There are all kinds of beliefs. But from the mouth of our Lord and Savior comes this promise. I will come and get you. I will be there. When you take your last breath, when your heart beats its last beat, when you pass from this life, whatever lies ahead, you don't go alone. And that's important. Because if you have confidence in what is going to happen, that confidence becomes a gift that you pass on and bequeath to those who love you so much and will miss you. It is a gift to be able to say to those who are gathering to mourn that the person that we have lost and that we mourn so profoundly knew God, knew Christ, and knew with great conviction where they were going. That is a gift to be able to say. No one wants to stand up in the pulpit at a funeral and go, well, we're hoping for the best. We're really not sure based upon the way she lived her life, but God is good and grace is sufficient. That's not the way you want to comfort somebody. In fact, it sounds really strange to say, but the best funerals I have ever done are the ones where I knew the person. I knew their faith, and I had been gifted the opportunity to talk about what they thought was going to happen, how they feel and whether their conviction is that they are ready for whatever lies ahead. Those are incredible gifts. They are almost miraculous because those are gifts that I am able to give to others, that I'm able to share with them. And when you, as individual persons, disciples, and beloved children of God, take the time to fearlessly wrestle with what happens at death, and you develop your own theology of death and hopefully resurrection, because we are Christians, what you find is that it gives you strength, it gives you courage, 
And it gives you power because that is something that you can give. You can share that conviction with others. I couldn't begin to count for you how many deathbeds I have been at at the age of 41 because of what I do. Well over a dozen. But I can tell you this, that I can remember with great clarity the ones where I was convinced that even as we were mourning the last breath, that there on the other side was God Almighty, waiting with open arms to receive those persons. And it was such a relief. Their fear, their pain, their suffering, their sickness, their sorrows were all over. For none of that exists on the other side. All of those things that we who remain will wrestle with until our dying day, they have been liberated from that and set free. But that's also because I have been forced through my education and my ordination, but also through my life to wrestle and develop my own theory of death and resurrection, and that has become my theology. That is something that I cling to because we've all seen people suffer. We all know what it is like for someone to be dealing with a sickness, a cancer, a disease, a breakdown of the body, the mind, and the failure of human life. We know what that is like. We have seen it in other people. We may have seen it for ourselves firsthand. We may have heard about it. And yet, this is what we have to confront. It will happen. But it doesn't mean that we have to mourn like those with no hope. And so when you think about this, the day will come, hopefully sooner rather than later, when you have the opportunity to have a conversation with people. And this is where our culture tells us, you know, you can try to kind of push back on that. If you've ever had someone begin that conversation with you, it can be very uncomfortable, even terrifying. When someone says, I want to talk to you about what's going to happen when I die. And our first impulse and response might be, I don't even want to think about that. Peter didn't. He looked at Jesus and he said, you can't die. And with the greatest of compassion, Jesus said, of course I can. And I must and I will. We all will. We will all reach that point. And Jesus knew that. That's why he was trying to help the apostles. They too needed to confront in their own way, so that their theology would be the ground upon which they stand on that day. Because you are going to have those moments when you are confronting your own mortality or the mortality of someone else where you feel the fear and the overwhelming sorrow. And that is natural. It is not evil. It is not sinful. That is what it is to be mortal, frail beings. But if you have the opportunity to lay some of that groundwork, that is the most Christ-like thing that you can do. That is what Jesus did with his apostles. Let me tell you what is going to happen. And they were bewildered. They were overwhelmed. Some of them were completely in denial. And some of them were having that hope of, he's just, you know, best case scenario. You know, he's just trying to prepare us, but this is not going to happen. But just in case, he's just trying to make sure we're going to be okay. No matter what happens you will be okay. Because there has never been a moment in your life where God has not been with you. With you always to the end of days. And when your life draws to a close here, God will be with you into the next life. You will never be alone. And you will go where all of those who have gone before are, with God. And it's a wonderful thing when you start to realize that what God has said is, I will hold you in trust. I will take you to myself, and there in perfect love, perfect forgiveness, and absolute grace will you dwell until the time when you are restored. That sounds like a wonderful thing. But if we don't think about it now, then on the day that it happens, we can't even begin to fathom it. So we have to think about that now. Now, almost every time I have gone to a church, there is someone who comes and hands me a rather large manila envelope, and within it are their plans for their funeral. It's 
It's a great way to introduce yourself to your pastor, I gotta tell you. Actually, I'm not even kidding to you. The fact that someone has thought about it, planned it, and then ensured that it has been passed on is one of my most blessed receipts. Like, I can't tell you how wonderful that is. Because when people are overwhelmed with grief, when they are wrestling with the anger that can arise, the shock, when those things are happening, it is truly a blessing to be able to say, you know, he planned for this. He planned for what he wanted. And I have it in his own writing. I have it for you. It is a gift. And I've been holding it in trust for you. So making those plans is not morbid. Making those plans may be in conflict with what happens outside of the church, but it is not anathema to who we are within the church. It is not. And it is okay to say, these are the things that I want. Here are the people I would like to speak. Here are the things that were meaningful to me. The scripture texts, the songs, the hymns. These are the prayers that brought me comfort, and I hope that they will bring comfort to those that I am leaving behind for just a time. We are not left behind forever. Our day too will come. And if you've ever had the opportunity, that incredible gift to be with someone who is dying, who knows with all confidence where they are going and who they are going to see, then you know that that is something to which we should all aspire. We should aspire to be able to go, I am leaving this world and I will see you again. I will see you again. And when I see you again, my bones and my body will no longer ache. When I see you again, my mind will be clear. My heart will be strong. My spirit will soar. Because nothing about the frail mortality of these vessels will go forth into the kingdom. We will be liberated from that. And I've said it before, the older I get, the more I'm really buying into that whole new body thing. Really excited for that new body. You know, and you can have conversations. I remember talking with one of our beloved family of faith as she was approaching her end of days. And I remember talking to her, and she had a sweet tooth. And I said, you know, how do you feel about this new body that, that we're going to get? How do you feel about that? And she was like, I can't wait till I don't have to count calories anymore. And I was like, hallelujah, I'm with you there. And I can remember laughing and people in the hospital ward being like, what, are you, what is wrong with you two? Well, she's dying. What is wrong with you? Well, she's dying and she knows where she's going. And she knows who has made her promises and she knows what those promises are and she does not fear. She is hoping that there will not be pain. She is hoping that she will be able to die with dignity. But she is not afraid. And even though I couldn't stay there for the last breath and the last beat, when I knew that she had gone, I looked back on that moment, and I even now can remember the smile on her face and going, thank you, God, for giving me that gift. That because of her faith, I have hope. That's what we can do. We can give that gift. We can plan those things. And there was a time when if you were planning funerals, it was very rigid, right? You had expectations. And I can tell you right now, cultural expectations are out the door. They are really out the door. If I believed that this is something that you wanted and something that was really important to you, we can reframe just about anything to give hope to those who are mourning. Now, that being said, there are certain artists and songs that we are probably not going to play in the church. I'm pretty sure Ozzy Osbourne is not happening in the sanctuary. But you know those songs, right? You know your personal anthem, not the one you sing in church, but the one you sing in the car. You know the things that brought you great joy, the things that were very particular, maybe even peculiar about you, that make you who you are. And you can even share that in your plans. You know, I have this conversation with my son pretty routinely because he's it. He's the one that's going to inherit everything I have, including, you know, the responsibility one day for doing whatever he does with my body. And I said, I don't really care what you do, just do it cheap. Because <laughs> you're probably not going to inherit that much, let's be honest. So, you know, don't do it really expensive. And he goes, do you want to be buried? And I was like, I don't care. Do you want to be cremated? Well, it's probably cheaper. 
What do you want me to do with your ashes? Oh, I don't know. But then we kind of developed a joke. I said, you know, I found out what you can do with ashes. You can do anything with ashes, by the way, nowadays. But I said, I found out this really cool thing. You can take some of my ashes, and you can turn them over to this lab, and they will grow a diamond from me. And I think, if anything, I should be grown into like a five-carat diamond. I was like, and then you can wear me, and people will be like, that's a nice rock. And you're like, that's my mom. And when he was little, and I'm talking like in preschool, because yes, we've been having these conversations for that long, and some of you are like, this is morbid. I get it, but this is also my job, and he knows. And he was like, I know what I'm going to do with your diamond. And I was like, okay, what are you going to do with my diamond? And at the time, he wanted to get a big old skull ring and put the diamond in the mouth of the skull. And I was like, whatever floats your boat, I'm dead. I don't care. But if having a skull ring with a diamond that was made from the ashes of your mother makes you feel good, Go forth. Go forth. But it's only because we have been having these conversations that he knows that he can say that. And it's not that he knows that I want to leave him, but I tell him all the time, long after I am gone, our connection is God. I will rest in God. And when you pray to God, when you worship God, when you praise God, when you sing to God, that is where I will be. And God will connect us to one another. So I hope that above making plans and trying to be the best parent that I can be and trying to be the best Christian and pastor that I can be, I hope that you realize that the faith that I have been trying to share with you and maybe even impart to you is really about giving you a gift that will outlast me. That our faith is a gift. And it is something that people take hope in. It is something that people can cling to. And even when our faith falters, when we are confronted with the loss of someone so precious, that we can look at them and remember their faith. Remember that they believe the promise, and if they can believe it with all that they are, just maybe we can too. Maybe we can too. So yes, I hope that you will have those conversations. If you can't have them with anyone else, you can have them with me. But I hope that you will find the boldness, the courage, and the hope to have them with those that matter, to have them with those that will be so deeply impacted, not only by your death, but how you transition from our hands to the hands of God Almighty. And that when that day comes that you next experience that transition, that you are able to remember what Jesus was telling us even before he died. That you should not let your hearts be troubled. You should resist the temptation to fall into hopelessness because you believe in God. You believe in Jesus Christ. You believe in the resurrection. And that he's coming back. He's not just coming back to put the capstone on this world. He's not just coming back for the ultimate redemption of all the work that he inaugurated at his birth. The Christ is coming back for you. To take you by the hand. And to bring you to God's self. And then in the fullness of time, when it is the right time, take you by the hand and lead you back to all of us. May that bring you hope. May it bring you courage and conviction. And above all, may it be a gift that you can share with others so that they too might be inspired to gracefully exit from this life. May it be so. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Right now, we would have new members, but two of this household are still in children's worship. So we're going to worship the Lord with our tithes and offerings and allow Hannah and Abigail a chance to return in here, and then we will receive the Langleys into membership. But we are so grateful for all of the gifts that allow us to continue to do the holy work, sometimes the difficult work but absolutely the vital and necessary work of the church. So with that, let us worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings.
Let us pray. Lord, the future is bright, and because of grace and your love, it is beautiful. And we pray, Lord, that the foundation upon which others can grow in their faith and embrace the promise of the resurrection will be done with these gifts, these tithes, and these offerings. Make them be part of the good work that Christ came to do and has bequeathed to all of those who bear his name. May it be so. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Are they coming back? They're refusing to. They're refusing to. <laughs> okay. Oh. Okay. Could you do me a favor and, and get the Langley girls for me so that we can take their parents into membership? <laughs> that, would be, that would be nice, unless you don't want them here. <laughs> but they will be rather upset with me if they're not here. It's not the first time somebody's refused me, so I won't take it personally. And I'm sure it won't be the last. Actually, Jeff and Lauren, will you join me up here so that we can be ready for them? Uh, you might recognize Lauren uh, if you had anything to do with vacation Bible school. Lauren was overseeing our preschool aspects so that you guys can come up here into the chancel. I know, it's, it's very intimidating. And if you've noticed the um, incredible outside of our church in the lawn, that, that is Jeff that has made that so possible. Thank you so much. And um, above all, I'm sure you recognize their girls. Miss Hannah, come with us here. There you go, my dear. Come on up. Good. So in the life of the church, one day you will have the opportunity to make your own vows, ladies. But today we're taking your parents in by transfer, okay? But in practice, if you would like to answer, you can answer too, okay? There's no prohibition. If you do it, it's okay. If you don't, it's all right. But we are going to do that because your parents, even though they are already Methodists, they are going to become a part of this church family formally. They are clearly already a very important part of our family. So as members of Christ's Universal Church, I ask you, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church to do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? If so, please say, I will. And as members of this congregation, Crozet United Methodist Church, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, please say, I will. Amen. Members of the household of God, I commend the Langley family to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. And if you will do so, will you join in the words upon the screen, we give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Will you receive this blessing? Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon the Langleys. We rejoice for the blessings that they already are, individually and as a family. And we rejoice, Lord, that because of this day, because of formally becoming a part of our family of faith, they will make us better. And we open ourselves to be transformed by your word, your presence, and your love in them. Thank you, Lord, for bringing them to us, uniting us in Jesus Christ, and allowing us to continue to build your kingdom here. May it be so. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. And I have certificates for you all. I know. Right? One day I will have one for you. And you. One day. But today, these are for your parents. Will you welcome the Langleys with me? Thank you all so much. You're welcome to go back. We are so grateful for all of those who have formally become a part of our family of faith. You are not required to do this, but uh, it is truly touching to see people that want to take that next step and be a part of us, for better or for worse, hopefully to make us better. Uh, so I do have some announcements I want to share with you this morning. I uh, want to take a moment to say thank you 
to everyone who has continued, started, and in many cases, increased over the last six months. We asked you to step up and jump in during the final quarter of last year, and it is thrilling to see so many of you join us on that giving journey. As part of our continued efforts to increase transparency, we've got some important financial information that is headed your way in the next few weeks, including mid-year statements and how we're handling this year's budget. So please be on the lookout for that information attached to your mid-year giving statements. And thank you so much for making the ministry of this church a reality because of your giving. I want to share with you that the middle school youth group has a busy summer schedule planned, fun activities throughout July and August, on the screen is a rundown of upcoming dates. They all run from 6 to 7 p.m. all over at Crozet Park. And on August 28th, they will have their first Sunday back here for regular meeting during the school year. And if you have any questions, please check in with Bart at youth at crozetunitedmethodist.org. And any children, any youth are allowed to come to this. They don't have to be Methodist. In fact, I believe a good like chunk of ours are actually Catholic. It's very ecumenical encourage you to embrace that. So our family of faith with the lodge, so we have a number of people who are over at the lodge at Old Trail who are part of our church family and are able to come because of the shuttle that the lodge brings over for our 11 o'clock worship, but we have a growing number that are no longer able to leave the building, mostly because of health issues. And so if you would like to be part of our outreach ministry, it's already off and ro rolling. We have 12 attendees last week for a service and I was able to go and have in-person communion with them. Our family of faith requires an hour or two of your time to head over to the lodge Sunday afternoons to simply play for them the 11 o'clock worship service that we get from YouTube. So you can reach out to David Banks for more information or to volunteer, and it was amazing to go. In fact, one of our members had been at the 11 o'clock worship service, and then we had a little bit of a technical mix-up, and so they watched the 9 o'clock contemporary, and the one who had been here for 11 o'clock was like, your sermons are not the same. And I was like, no, they are not. So if you come to 9 o'clock and then you go over there and watch the 11 o'clock, you get different sermons. So you have that opportunity, and um, they would love to see you. They are truly some of the most beautiful, wonderful people in our family of faith, and it would be a blessing to be a part of that. And you only have to sign up for one at a time. And then John Hilker is still looking for leadership nominations, especially with regards to our staff parish, which is our personnel position on the church council. Our praise band is looking to add a guitarist, so if you or anyone you know might be interested, you can talk or email to uh, Gary Bibbins. If you haven't joined Realm or you need help, Use the Realm Help Portal on the homepage of our website, crozetunitedmethodist.org, and we'll be happy to connect you there. But we are so grateful for each and every one of you and for what God has been able to do with us and through us and for us. So we are grateful, and with gratitude in our hearts, let us stand as we are able and join together in our closing song, We Believe.
believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, and He's coming back. He's coming back again. Thank you for being a part of what God has done here today and for being a part of what God will do in the days ahead. Will you receive this blessing? No matter what lies ahead, God is with you and for you. You will never be alone. You may have been lost, but you are found. And now God is sending you forth to help others discover that they too are beloved and found, precious and holy in God's sight. So may you be the connection that helps others discover the glory of our God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the hope of the resurrection. Go forth in peace in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one now and forever. Amen.